Hello everyone, welcome to my channel RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. And Occasionally, I do an interview and this week it gives me great pleasure to have on the channel Luke Gygax. Luke, welcome to the channel. Hey, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it and uh, always great to be able to talk to fellow gamers. Well, it's always great to uh, talk to uh, gaming legends. <laughs> Uh, it's part of the privileges of having the channel. Um, so why don't we go ahead and jump right into it. Um, what are some of the projects that you've got going on uh, right now that might be D&D related, RPG related, or just things in general? Well, really, the, the big thing that's on my radar right now is we're about 90 days away from GaryCon. Uh, and that's got to be my, my number one. And there's all sorts of things that are that are wrapped into GaryCon, um, uh, especially uh, writing. Uh, typically, I'm writing modules for... Uh, the Gary Con Open, because we have a little hiatus due to the pandemic. Right. I'm going to use, uh, the Horde, which is uh, a great module I did with uh, Chris Clark. Uh, old school module. It's uh, compatible with uh, first edition uh, or first you know, retro clone uh, of first edition games. So that'll be our, our tournament this year. And I'm also working on uh, a continuation uh, to a series uh, from the Eye of Shintuki which I'm writing with Matt Everhart in 5th edition, so it's uh, uh, newer stuff. We're doing the heart of Shintupi, which uh, Shintupi is the major city in my blighted lands, Okram setting. Uh, so that's on the creative side, uh, kind of that's what I'm working on at the moment. And of course, all the logistics that goes with Gary Khan, like running any event. So imagine planning a, a big operation if you're in the military, a giant training exercise, or if you're, uh, you know, work uh, in a, a normal type of job, planning a a convention trip, like an annual meeting or something like that, and all the details that go along with that. Uh, kind of like herding cats, I guess. <laughs> but I love it. So so you you are in the military, right? Yes, yes. I'm a lieutenant colonel, and I'm full-time National Guardsman. So that's a component, two of the armed forces. So uh, I go to work every day uh, in uniform, and I am a brigade executive officer for the 224th Sustainment Brigade. Uh, out of Long Beach, California, and we are the Dragon Slayers. Oh, that's awesome. How did that name come about? Yeah, I, I guess it's just because, uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, it was a St. George and the Dragon, right? Who, uh, uh, you know, he, he killed, killed the dragon. And logistics, logistics is like slaying dragons because uh, nobody really appreciates all the work that goes into logistics. If you're doing it right, it's seamless, effortless, and no one even thinks about it. But there's a lot of coordination to make that happen. I was in the military myself and I was in logistics. So I completely oh. understand. Uh, yeah. So uh, that uh, military training is definitely helping you out planning with Gary Con then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really like putting together any, any major exercise and just thinking all the different things that you got to do. And, and I have a, so thank God that there's so many wonderful people who are willing to help out Gary Con staff over the years uh, and including this year has been great. And there's no way this is, this can be done by one person. So it's a team effort. And I, I want to make sure everyone, I thank all of those guys and girls who are helping me out. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a big coordinated effort to get something like that going on. Uh, what kind of attendance do you think you're going to have this year? Yeah. So that's, that's really uh, anyone's guess. Uh, I was very optimistic at first. So I was like, okay, this is great. We've, we've really got, you know, COVID, uh, you know, beat, we've got, uh, uh, you can get vaccinated and gosh, you know, everything's going to be pretty much, you know, close to normal. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen, you know, there was the Delta variant that has come along and then there's the Omicron variant and it's kind of putting a crimp in things. And we even see some European countries, you know, shutting down again and we still have mass mandates. Uh, so I think I was looking, I was hoping for about 90% initially. I've scaled that back. I think we're going to be about 50 to 65%. Uh, so, I think instead of 2,800, we'll see maybe, oh, we got 1,200, 12, 1,300 right now. So maybe we'll see 15 to 1,700 people, you know, 1,800 people on the outside. So it'll be more like a Gary Con 9 or Gary Con 10, maybe. Well, that still sounds very fun, kind of intimate, oh, yeah. really. You know, with that many attendees, it's not super overcrowded. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be there. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, it's going to be uh, the uh, the very first. So you're um, running some events up there as well, like you, um, the modules that you're running. Are they going to be available for download PDF or drive through or anything like that? Yeah, you know, I, I just started creating uh, modules back for GaryCon 6, I think it was, that I started uh, 5 or 6. I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and 
start doing some writing. I'm doing the logistics side of it, but but I was like, man, I, you know, anyone can do not anybody, but logistics is important. But other people can do the logistics. But really, I should create the Gary Con Open every year and do that as a you know, my dad really enjoyed when I would do creative ventures, and he encouraged me in that regard. So I figured I, I will do it for Gary Con. I never thought I would put them out there for sale widely, uh, but people brought up to me over the years like, you've done the work. Why wouldn't you just put this out there so i was like okay sure absolutely good point. makes sense yeah so, yeah, the, so, uh, so it's like sure. an, it's a, the open it's like a tournament yes so there i've written a module uh every every year since then that is uh like a two round typically a two round um tournament style uh written in a 1e or a retro clone uh style uh and it's basically you know meant to be something along the lines of the ad and d open from you know, early Gen Con days. That when you, sounds exciting. Yeah, and it's fun. And I try to make them a little bit challenging. And I set, uh, you know, a few of them in my uh, Blighted Land setting, uh, which I kind of created for the first one uh, after returning from a deployment to Iraq, you know, deserty, uh, uh, blighted terrain, you know, heat and sure, unpleasant. Sure, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it was deeply ingrained in me at that time. So I, I made a world and, and a little backstory as to how that existed. But yes, if you want to if you want to get a sampling of some of my writing, it's expanding and we're adding more and more to it. But uh, currently I'm, I'm on drive through RPG. Just search Gygax and you can uh, find the modules that I have out there. Uh, I'll tell you got, what I'll do is uh, uh, I will definitely put a link for that in the description. Right. Oh, thank you. So one that was a lot of fun was Nightfall. I don't know if you can see that or get some glare. But oh, there you go. I saw it. That looks good. Yeah. Looks yeah, really yeah good. Who did the art on that? That's Jeff Butler. Jeff Butler, uh, old TSR artist. He did Gary Con 8 art. He did Gary Con 10 art. Gary Con 8 was the uh, fire giant with the two-headed uh, hellhound. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and they did 10, which is a uh, solar or like, kind of like a, the Archangel Michael that looks curiously like my similar a little bit to my father uh uh fighting uh fighting a a, a lich a, you know or a skeletal knight or something like that in an army of undead and that was kind of my homage to my the idea of my father living on through gary Khan. Awesome. uh yeah and then he did the art for 13 but uh my art concept once i once we got it done and we showed it there my uh, staff kind of pointed out well having a troll ripping a you know, even a Nazi soldier's arm off and beating him with it is probably a little too violent for the main con t-shirt, Gary Khan's a family event, you know. I was like, oh, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. But I'll use it for the cover of the module that uh, I felt inspired to write. Uh, again, with Chris Clark, who's a good friend of mine, a good friend of my father's too. Uh, so essentially, it was uh, inspired by the uh, Sturmgeschutz and Sorcery uh, chainmail battle that took place at a, gosh, a much earlier Gen Con, I believe, where uh, one side, it's a miniatures battle, and one side is told, oh, uh, you're playing tactics or something like that, and you're going to, uh, there's some, uh, some partisans causing problems in Russia, and you've got to go out there with your little patrol force and attack them. And on the fantasy side, you're a raiding group of, your wizard commanding a raiding group of orcs and with a troll, and you're going to go somewhere. Well, somehow you get, mixed across dimensions wow. and and the nazis uh nazi soldiers at world war ii end up facing the wizard and his troll and I the orcs play. i want to play i mean yeah. you got me yeah. I'm, I'm sold yeah. yeah so that's so that's that's nightfall so i just use that as inspiration for nightfall uh, like knigget knigget fall uh that's on there and then uh, obviously the horde i think is up there that's a that's really cool that introduces uh the thunder frost dragon that's art by larry elmore um I also did a module. It should be up soon. I want to get this one up. Uh, the Trouble in Lock Geneva that I wrote with uh, uh, Jeffrey Telanian uh, okay. from Northwind, Northwind Adventures, the creator of Hyperborea, uh, who's also a great, good friend of mine, friend of my father's as well, really very talented designer. Uh, if you haven't seen his works, I would personally encourage you to, to check it out. He's, he's that good. Uh, we wrote The Trouble in Lock Geneva, also in first edition compatible. Uh, and uh, that was just a lot of fun. Uh, it's basically something has happened to the Dwarf King in the Wyvern Peak Mountains in the Blighted Lands in the world of Oak Rim. And you must go all the way up, uh, way, way high up Mount Gigantor and uh, see what has befallen them. And uh, again, I like that Thunder Frost Dragon. So uh, you get introduced to the Thunder Frost Dragon there as well. So uh, that was what came out in 2020. The much maligned year <laughs> where COVID oh struck goodness. us. Yeah. 
That year was a trauma for us. Uh, I'm really uh, interested in the uh, tournament aspect of that. You know, when I was a kid, I, when I really first got into D&D &D and, and all those tournament modules were coming out, you know, the uh, A series. And oh, yeah. Of course, obviously, the G and all those original mm -hmm. tournament modules. I had those modules, right? In the mm -hmm. 80s, early 80s, I was like 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. you know, and the dream was to go to Gen Con and and play those modules with Gary, you know, or or see Gary Gygax and uh, do the, uh, you know, do the tournament. And that sounded so exciting. And we actually ran some of the tournaments at the at our houses in our basements, you know, the way the tournament because they had the tournaments laid out with the pre-generated pre mm -hmm. characters and all that kind of stuff. But I've never, never gotten to play in a tournament in my life. So it's fun. I mean, it's fun. I like I mean, I like uh, tournament. The tournaments are, are are fun, but it's definitely different than the way you would play in your home campaign, right? Right. Because sure. it, you know, essentially it's a it's a one shot. You've got to just lay it all out in the line. You know, you know that potion. There's not you don't have a big backstory about how you got that potion or the special item that you're going to use, or you know, you don't have any of that angst about burning through your magic items, right? Right. Or or risking your character on maybe what's not the most well thought out plan, right? Because you're not going to see this character, and you didn't invest years into developing. Sure. But it's fun. That sounds exciting. Uh, so I understand that you're uh, presiding over a wedding at Gary Con. Yes, that is uh, some very exciting news. That's pretty late breaking. Uh, my, I've, I've been friends with uh, Satine Phoenix for a number of years. She's come to Gary Con since I believe Gary Con eight. Uh, she just showed up with a mutual friend of ours, Jason Elliott, who. Uh, worked on Gygax magazine and putting that out. And uh, uh, he brought her and I got introduced to her and she was just so, so, so nice. And um, when I was in, moved down to LA, she had me on her GM tip show, which she took over for Matt uh, Mercer. Right. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so I just got, you know, just got to know her a little bit better over the years. And we've, you know, corroborated, collab collaborated on stuff. She was the first host of Founders and Legends. She's been on you know, help me with Founders and Legends as well, so it's great. And uh, last year she met, uh, I think it was last year, yeah, she met uh, a guy named Jameson Stone, who's another uh, designer, really, really nice guy. Met him at Gen Con. Uh, personally, I just corresponded with him. And, man, they hit it off just like peas and carrots. They're they're the best together. And when oh. we're at Gen Con, oh, there, it's, it's like you see it online, you're not sure, is that true? No, they are really like, like they're like that in person. They, they, are a great match. I mean, they seem so happy together. And, and uh, you know, I told them, so I said, gosh, you guys just look so happy. Congratulations. It's really heartwarming. And they said, well, you know what? Um, due to a technicality, uh, the paperwork we did in Vegas uh, to get married, because they hit a loop, uh, isn't correct. So we need to get married again. And I was like, okay. And they're like, would you do it at GaryCon? I said, sure. So I applied to be a minister and I'm uh, officially a uh, minister of the universal uh, universal church i was gonna ask you and, about that yeah 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 and uh so i do have to uh i'm not sure if i have to fly there i just have to contact the clerk of courts give them my credentials and, ahead of time and make sure that it's all authorized and then on thursday at 8 p.m at gary con we're going to uh hold a ceremony for uh satine and jameson where i will officially unite <laughs> them uh as a couple in the uh, eyes of uh, uh, in the eyes of the you know, legally binding contract, marital contract, That's awesome. and uh, yeah, and I'll do it dressed as the uh, Gary Con Wizard. So if you've seen Jeff that, Easley, is that on your shirt? Is it the one? On uh, your shirt? It is not. No, oh, this is okay. this this is artwork by. Uh, uh, oh my gosh! Oh come on! <laughs> I'm gonna. Sorry. He's a he's super. Oh, yeah, he's super talented. He does all the uh, dungeon crawl classic stuff. He's a great dude. I love him. Uh, Oh, you get a uh, uh, This is embarrassing. <laughs> I, I, uh, Doug Kovacs, thank you. Jeez, thank you, Brain, for working. Doug Kovacs, who's another, he's a great guy, a friend of mine, and he did amazing artwork for Gary Con 14. So uh, okay. thank you, Doug, for, for doing that. But uh, uh, yeah, so the Jeff Easley did basically a bust of a wizard, you know, a white beard and kind of a little bit balding and stuff, but he's got this, uh, you know, uh, purple and red robe. Uh, I think, well, I'm going to marry him and it's going to be a themed wedding and costume and stuff, which, which is what they, what they prefer. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get those robes done up. So I, am fortunate enough being in Los Angeles to, uh, I've been referred to a guy who does costuming for 
you know, Marvel Studios and, and, and other folks. And he's making me a really cool three layered, you know, uh, That's wizard be awesome. robe. Yeah. No, That's I'm going to, awesome. I think I'm going to go on the road here and start marrying people. I can do uh, fantasy themed weddings. So. <laughs> yep. Hey, you got yourself a side gig. There you go. <laughs> so I, I know this story has been told quite a bit. I mean, like Jolly tells it all the time, but, um, why don't you uh, talk about the origins of Gary Khan? Because I, I, I just want to hear it from you, if you don't oh, mind. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, so this was a, honestly, it came out of a, a, a just a terrible time in anyone's life. The loss of a parent sure. is so, it's so traumatic. And, and honestly, I felt like, uh, like I was almost watching myself go through those days. You feel very disconnected in, uh, in what's going on. But uh, essentially, we were planning for his funeral. And so many people just reached out to us and expressed how important my father was to them uh, in different ways. They, many people said, well, you know, I may not have met your father, but his work shaped my life and it changed me for the better. And it's, you know, helped me through a learning disability. It got me away from a negative home environment. It got me away from gangs. Uh, I met my best friend. I met my wife, whatever it is, those stories, uh, or it helped me find you know, uh, showed me how to create stories and show that I loved doing that. And now I'm a screenwriter or whatever the case was. So there's so many of those uh, stories and people felt moved even to, to drive to Lake Geneva to pay their respects. And they, again, weren't necessarily friends with my father. Perhaps they met him at a convention, uh, but they just felt so moved. Uh, so we had a small uh, funeral ceremony. I thought, well, if people are driving here, I really would like to give them something a place to gather and to pay the respects that's maybe not, you know, as formal as, as, as a funeral service. So I rented the American Legion Hall, which was the site of some early Gen Cons and certainly conventions like uh, Winter Fantasy and Spring Revel uh, way back in the 70s and very early 80s. And we played the D&D cartoon on the wall. We played the Futurama episode. Uh, we had food and drink. Uh, available for people and a podium and a microphone where people could share their favorite story about my dad. And people were doing that. And I think there was, I don't know, 150 or 200 people there. And I believe uh, Jolly, excuse me, there was Jolly was, was nearby chatting. And I believe it was Harold Johnson, who was another early TSR employee. Uh, came up and he said, hey, look, this was, this was really a lot of fun. You should do it again next year. And Jolly piped in and said, yeah, you can call it GaryCon. And, and uh, that's because they have, uh, you know, obviously Jolly uh, nice writes the dinner, nice table. dinner table, right? Yep. And in their world, there is a guy named Gary Jackson. Gary Jackson, yep. Yeah, from he Hard Eight Games. Gar Hard Eight Games. <laughs> and so that's a mix of my dad, Gary Gygax, and Steve, Steve Jackson, Jackson yep. the American Steve Jackson, and the Texas Steve Jackson. Right. And and uh, yeah, and so I said, okay, yeah, sure, we'll we'll do it. And I thought I would just hold a game day uh, every year. So the following year, I rented the American Legion Hall and. Uh, it wasn't a business. It was just me renting, renting the hall and saying, show up. And I made, I made t-shirts just because I thought that would be neat. Uh, uh, so that, that was, that was a lot of fun, but the guys from, from Kenzer showed up and they brought a truckload or a van load of stuff. And they said, just ask for donations. And then, uh, I think Tim Cask and a few other folks came together, uh, and they said, Hey, we should help you raise some money. Let's, auction some stuff off. So I, you know, I think I pulled out whatever a few things I had in my bag. Jolly did some uh, quick, uh, you know, car uh, cartoon type sketches and, and people just pulled things out and we ended up raising, I don't know, a few hundred, like two, 300 bucks more than I, than I needed in costs. And I was like, well, geez, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Cause I, I didn't want to keep the money. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll start, we'll start something and, and make a, you know, either a, some sort of, some sort of business to to carry this work on and 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 do good and and over the years it developed into uh you know good omen productions an llc that that runs gary con now and uh gosh you know up until 2019 uh, we held conventions that were growing and growing by anywhere from 20 to 35 percent or so each year that's awesome that's that's a great story i really as as a gamer i, I remember um so let me tell you a little so I'm going to share a story with you. So I met your dad in Gen Con 2007. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. um, it was just brief, you know, signing autograph kind of thing. 
And uh, so I did not wait that long. I only waited 15, 20 minutes. I guess I caught a law in the thing because uh, the story was that the lines were wrapped around the building, but I, I had just happened to walk up and, oh, this was easy. <laughs> right? But Good the cool thing was um, I spent a short amount of time just kind of like listening to the interactions because that was interesting to me. Um, and your dad was so cordial to everybody. And he just like, he seemed to pick out a thing with everybody he talked to because everybody had a story, of course. Mm -hmm. Me too. And uh, yeah. so it was just kind of like personable. And I, you know, um, I got my my photo shoot with, with Gary where he had my arm around him and I got to, uh, that was a highlight, you know, I'm, I still look back on that. Uh, but I was really happy with the fact that I got to meet him on that last Gen Con. I, I did not know that it was going to be the last one, obviously. Um, but then um, I remember hearing about you guys getting together and Jolly with the Gary Con thing cracked me up because I thought about that. You know, I was, I was thought, man, if they had, if they had, a, they, had they should have a Gary Con. That, that you know, just makes total sense. And then you guys did it. And I, and I was just yeah. like, wow, how awesome is that? You know? Yeah. And it, yeah. I had no, I really just thought I was going to hold a party every year, you know, game day to it's still and a I party. Had, it's absolutely going to be a party. <laughs> yeah. And I had no idea if it was going to be 50 people or, or, you know, 500 people. I certainly never thought it would be a couple thousand people. Uh, uh, but it, but it's great. And, and that's that's part of it. It's you know, all my family is there, his close, you know, people who work with them. It started off, you know, with that in mind. Sure. And and what my concept of for the feeling or the, you know, the atmosphere was the camaraderie and the closeness that I felt at the early conventions that I went to as a kid where you could just walk up. I would just walk up to a table and be like, hey, is they're an open seat, right? And people oftentimes would say yes, sometimes it wasn't, right? But you felt okay walking up to a table and asking. Right, sure. And I, yeah, I noticed at other conventions, like nowadays, you really, I didn't feel that uh, prior, you know. And I said, well, I, I want that at Gary Con. So we just charge a badge fee. We don't charge per event. And if there's an open seat, uh, we have uh, basically like a, like a pizza, you know, the little pizza stand, little uh a menu stand or whatever it's just a little silver pole with a holder you put a green flag up means you have seats available and you're welcoming players you put a red flag up means like okay you're already into the game where there's no seats available oh, so people cool. can just look around the room if there's a green flag walk up and say hey do you mind if i play and the answer should be yes because the green flag is up sit down and and, and play the game because oh, because that's, awesome. uh, that's what it's about it's it's about my dad loved playing games all kinds of games he didn't care if it was pinochle shogi go uh, railroad games, D and D, miniatures. He loved games with a capital G. So it's about gaming, and he loved. He welcomed people to <laughs> to his home, literally. I mean, I'm I'm not. This is I'm totally serious. I'm not making stuff up. People would knock on his door when he lived at 316 Madison Street in Lake Geneva, and I would see it. I was in college. And I'd be visiting, and they'd say, "Are you Gary Gygax?" He's like, "Yes, I am." Like, "Oh wow, what an honor to meet you. We just heard, you know, we heard this was your place. You just wanted to say hi." You're, you know, it's, he's like, well, okay, well, come on in, have sit down. You want to like a cup of ice, you know, glass of iced tea or something. And a lot of, you know, he'd chat with him for a few minutes. And if he had an opening in one of his games, he'd be like, well, you know what? Uh, I have an opening on my Thursday game. Do you want to play? And that's how we got two or three people over the years is just from that sort of interactions. And he, that's great. He, and that's how he was all his life. Because gaming used to be the kind of thing, if you met someone who was a gamer, you better say, hey, here's my information, let's play games together because there might only be four of you in town or something, right? right? sure. Yeah, and, and so he just kept that that relaxed nature and I, you know, I, there's a quote, he's like, I want people to remember I'm just a guy who loved making games and, you know, got to share them with the world. He he didn't have a a big ego about that sort of, sort of thing. So uh, people ask me a lot, what do you think your dad would how do you think you would feel now if you knew that whatever it is, you know, 40 million people are, or whatever playing D and D uh, I think he'd be amazed, <laughs> you know, and humbled. And I think he was even when it was four or 5 million people playing D and D that's sure. pretty incredible. Yeah. I, in my house, at my house, uh, Pinochle was like every Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we always played clue and monopoly and all those different board games growing up. I mean, like I had a big, uh, you know, games background myself. So, you know, it's like when I, when I heard that he played Pinochle on a regular basis, like, oh, that's awesome. Well, you know, like, that would have been cool to play some Pinochle. 
Yeah, Barry. he played he played cribbage. He'd love to play cribbage. Right. Uh, I played flu with him before. I mean, that's fine. But a lot of times he would also he liked to create games, so he'd also modify games. If we were playing a game, he might come back to it and be like, "We should change this rule or let's add this card." So. I can just see that happening. Uh, so, mm-hmm. what other guests? What kind of guests are we going to be are going to be at Gary Khan? Uh, I'm not looking. So if you go to GaryCon.com, you can see our special guests there and it's getting updated. And of course, there's some flex because like I said, COVID is COVID is a thing. So uh, some people, uh, you know, if they have uh, there's conditions. There's a mask requirement that, though. Everybody, you have to wear a oh, mask at GaryCon. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You can check uh, some of the, in the news posts, uh, post up there. And I think I even had a link to a little YouTube where I talked to people about it. But yes, uh, where everyone, of course, it's a good idea. Absolutely. I wasn't sure. I think Absolutely. I said, hey, mask, mask mandate may be lifted and that could be different. I don't think it's going to be lifted. I think we'll be wearing masks. And I think that's the right thing to do in general when you're out in, in public under the current situation. I prefer that everyone and I highly encourage everyone to be uh, fully vaccinated and even boosted, even get that third shot. I think that's showing some efficacy. Uh, if you, for some reason, can't uh, uh, get vaccinated and you still choose to come to Gary Con, I didn't want to exclude uh, folks who might have particular medical condition that that you sure. know wouldn't allow them to be vaccinated, you will need to have a negative COVID test within 72 hours in order to get your badge. Right. Uh, so that was that was kind of the policy at the time, and we don't uh, we we stop and you know, we don't do badge refunds after the beginning of the year because so many resources are already committed to producing the show. It's right. uh, very difficult. So uh, I don't want to change that. But again, I highly, highly, highly encourage people, please get uh, vaccinated if you're coming to Gary Khan. Uh, we want to be safe. We want to you know, do as much as we can to mitigate uh, risk to people who are coming there. I, and and if, if there is a risk and, and you're somebody who, who it's not wise for you to come, please don't come. Stay home. We'll, we'll be there next year. Come and support us in the future when you can do so safely, and and you know are that's there, really are way there more virtual important. Virtual events for Gary Khan also. Absolutely, you can stay home and play uh, uh, virtual uh, virtual events like we did for uh, Gary Khan twelve and thirteen. Once again, my good friend uh, Matt Everhart, aka Casey Rift, and his friend Jimmy Duffy will be uh, working that angle for us, and they just did yeoman's work uh, for Gary Khan twelve. In about three weeks, we shifted and pivoted to an all virtual convention. And we showed wow. that it could be done. Oh, yeah, we showed it could be done. And within three weeks, we went from like under 100 people doing the virtual convention, you know, 50 or something in a, in a very small number of events to over 600 events wow. and like 2,000 attendees. So, yeah. Uh, and we did that inside of three weeks. And th- again, this wasn't me. <laughs> it certainly <laughs> wasn't me. Uh, th- this, this goes to the, the amazing people who help every year behind the scenes. Uh, it's so important. If you want to, if you come to Gary Con and you want to help, uh, you can go click on the volunteers a tab on our website and reach out and talk to Frank and Ryan, and they'd be glad to roll you into the team that way. And if you want to help out virtually, because we always need people on Discord to help out and that sort of stuff, uh, there's a way to reach out to uh, uh, Matt and Jimmy and uh, let them know. Certainly on the Gary Con Discord, you can do that as well. That's great. And of course, um, running the live events, you're still taking um, volunteers to do the uh, to run GMs and stuff to run the events. That Absolutely. Yeah. Yet. Event submission is open until the end of the year. Uh, so please uh, just go to play.garycon.com and that'll take you to our be current in the doobly do. <laughs> that'll take you to the current tabletop event site and you can buy a badge if you haven't done so already. And then. Uh, clicks, you know, submit events and uh, submit events. And I encourage everyone, even if you haven't done it, uh, run a game at a convention before, it's really not too bad. I think we all get a little bit nervous when we run for a new group. I still get nervous when yeah, I run absolutely. for a new group. I think that's human. But pick your favorite, favorite system, an adventure that you've run and had a lot of fun with before, and just bring that to the table and show some people this system you might make some converts to a system that you love or introduce somebody to an author or designer they're not familiar with and generally just have a good time i think when you're once you get over that initial jitters you're going to find that it's pretty rewarding and hopefully carry on through that at other conventions and uh, gary cons in the future too that's awesome i'm running two i'm running two i've got oh great yeah i'm doing uh this one rats in the uh, walls by hyper oh yeah 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 uh, I've got some miniatures for this. 
this is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a lot of fun. I, I ran this twice already, and this is a great, um, uh, a great adventure. It's got a, um, an inn that's being plagued by rats, and it gets interesting from there. And then I am running ah, Tower of Xenopus, which nice. is like the first uh, adventure that I personally ever ran in 1981 because everybody had the Malve set and no, nobody had that. And ah. I could, so there was a module there that nobody had that I could run. Uh -huh. very first, uh, very first invention. I've run it multiple times to start campaigns over the years, so those are the two that I'm running. Oh. Yeah, that's that's awesome. The other, the other, we talked about stuff that I'm doing. The other fun thing uh, that I'm doing this year is the Dread from Geneva Lake, which is a actual Call of Cthulhu adventure. Uh, Call that's of Cthulhu. going Call of Cthulhu. That's I'm writing it with Skeeter Green. Uh, oh, wow. So thank goodness, yeah, Skeeter's great. And uh, uh, so we just came up with this. Yeah, you know, I said, well, let's do something. Well, every year, Alyssa Fadden, who's just a fantastic cartographer and lovely person, uh, she just volunteered to make maps for GaryCon. So we do the layout of the uh, Grand Geneva in a style, you know, different style. So for the Trouble in Lock Geneva, she did the maps and <laughs> the Grand Geneva is the Dwarf King's, um, the Dwarf King's castle, right? And I was like, okay, so we've done fantasy, we've done like underground, underwater before. How about either something espionage related, you know, Gamma World or future related, or maybe like horror related? And I reached out and talked with Alyssa, and she suggested Skeeter as an option, and he was so jazzed to do it. So we decided to run it essentially modern day a Gary Khan at the Excelsior Hotel, just be, just in case they didn't want me to use their name, right? So no no relation to the actual convention center. Uh, and, and yeah, it's an official call of Cthulhu adventure uh, that we're doing. It'll be just tons of fun. I don't want to give too much away, uh, but I did get, I wanted to incorporate music into it somehow. Right, sure. uh, well, hopefully no one's, hopefully no one who's going to play it will be there. But there's uh, the, the idea, the idea I had is uh i'm like okay so we're gonna they're gonna get shifted to a little bit of a different dimension right uh kind of like an upside down or something along those lines i said wouldn't it be neat if we had a clue in a record album that you could play backwards right oh wow right because you know you're you're kind of child of the 80s right you know if you play it backwards there's just like a hidden satanic message in there right Paul so is dead. <laughs> right, yeah exactly exactly so it's like we gotta do that and the problem was if you put any music in, in a, you know, you have to, there's licensing or you'll get in trouble somehow. So it's like, well, maybe we could make an original score, uh, original song. I, I figured, well, maybe it'd just be like 30 seconds. So I reached out to Eric Harris, who's the, you know, lead singer and the uh, kind of the guy behind the band, Gygax, uh, kind of heavy metal band. Right. I'm, I'm it, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Gygax. It's great. Great mm -hmm. stuff. I really enjoy it. And uh, he's like, absolutely, dude. And so he made like, a three minute song <laughs> you know That's with the the lyrics awesome. that skeeter and i made up and and it yeah it has clues to has clues to what's going on so uh and yeah so anyway it's 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 great and it's it's a great song i, I really like it so is that gonna um, be available after gary Khan at all maybe? yeah yeah it should be available at gary Khan. yeah oh and that's gonna be great okay cool yeah yeah, so that that'll be neat. And I, we'll have to figure out how to do like a you know scan it and play it on your phone or whatever for the for the song but Really cool. And I actually have some uh, Gygax band uh, shirts that will be available at GaryCon, too. Uh, Eric had a few, and I was like, hey, man, can I buy some from you? I'd just like to sell them at GaryCon because they're cool shirts, and I love I love the guys from Gygax. So uh, they they won't be at this GaryCon, uh, uh, but, yeah, it, it is. Uh, I'm going to have to get them there. I had them at Founders and Legends. They played at Founders and Legends, too, when I did it at a studio uh, before covid uh, got us but it's, people who are coming to gary con it's a lot of returning uh guests uh a lot of times and a few new ones we have uh, janelle k will be back matthew lillard should be joe manganello of course jim ward uh, uh tim cask uh mike uh mike carr uh, zeb cook uh That's will be awesome. there what a great yeah. list yeah larry elmore uh, wow. jeff easley uh you know dave laforce uh, comes every year uh errol otis uh, comes every year 
uh, gosh, who else? Is, I think we're going to have some newbies in um, Mike Pondsmith should be coming mm-hmm. this year. Again, uh, he's, you know, again, that COVID dependent, he's, he's very set on, on maintaining, you know, safety. Uh, but I have to double check with him, but yeah, there's just, just a, a, a ton of really cool uh, people that come to Gary Khan. And again, the idea is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's int- I guess intimate would be the way to say it. There, there, right, people sure. are approachable. You just go, you know, you can go, go up to the bar and grab a, you know, grab a sandwich and, and have a beverage. And next to you could be, you know, various designers or or whomever, artists, etc. And just be able to strike up a conversation and, and and chat with them. I think that's part of what's fun about Gary Khan is that it is small enough. There's that camaraderie and ability to really just share the space and chat and interact with folks that, that I haven't felt at a lot of other conventions. Matt, right. I, I, that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to, ex- to attending myself. Uh, yeah. It's the first one I've attended in over 10 years. So I'm really looking forward to it. Oh no, that'd be great. Oh, and, thanks for coming. Um, so I have a question. Uh, do you use, when you, when you uh, run games, do you use music to uh, in your games? I'm, I'm pretty minimalist right. uh, in, in my gaming. I don't get to do nearly Uh, as much gaming as i would like to i am you know i'm a (laughs) lieutenant colonel in the army brigade except right that's a busy job i've got three little girls uh a wife i run gary con i do some writing on the side i sit on a board of directors for a manufacturing company so right i don't i don't just don't have a whole bunch of time uh to do stuff but i tend to do most of my playing on streams or at conventions uh to be honest with you uh, and one thing, my own style, I'm more minimalist. My dad was always theater of the mind. We didn't have music. It was really being focused on the game and sure. immersed in, in, in that way. Uh, but I recognize a lot of people enjoy, and it, it helps uh, people to have visual aids, whether it's beautiful Dwarven Forge train uh, sure. from, my, from my buddy Stefan or uh, Sirenscape uh, music. Uh, right. I think uh, Ben Looms is just... Uh, a great guy. I had the good fortune to interview him for Founders and Legends. And, uh, you know, he talked to me and I learned about Sirenscape. And man, if you haven't checked it out, I think they have free, free, you can download a free version and check it out. It is amazing. It, you know, I thought, oh, sound effects, I'm going to play, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings music in the background while, while we're gaming. That is not this at all. You can, there's prepackaged, uh, prepackaged, uh, you know, I audio like the scenarios, tavern, the tavern yeah. with the crowd noise. And you can, yeah. as the DM, you can sit there and you can uh, hit, uh, hit up a burp or something you know, if you want to at a certain period of time. Yeah. Uh, or whatever. Yeah. Or, or, or do the thunderstorm with the thunder and cue when the, when the thunder cracks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I've, I've, I've got that. Yeah. Of course. So, they, so yeah. So Sir- Sirenscape is, is, is amazing stuff and it never repeats and it, you, you know, you can, uh, tailor it to exactly what you want or pull off the shelf already constructed stuff like the tavern and this sort of thing and just use some of those hot keys to to update it uh so i think those are some wonderful additions to uh to our game uh, that can be incorporated i haven't done that i'm still like throw my battle mat down with some markers here you go okay you need you know a couple plastic uh, minis if you need to to get an idea but really it was always theater of the mind for me and sure. that's 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 how it was done and my dad didn't really like to lay things out on maps anyway because he wanted you to do the mapping right uh, I know. A, a lot of the old school in, in my opinion what I, I mean my take on it is part of the challenge of the game in the early days was doing your own maps looking for patterns dead space other things that would give clues to maybe where something was hidden in a in a complex or or provide some sort of clue to you so uh, that was pretty much verbally described and you had to, to map it and certain things may have been uncertain. Uh, I know that's not popular now, but if you had the good fortune to go through or misfortune, I don't know how you want to look at it, the challenge of going through Castle Greyhawk, my dad's Castle Greyhawk, there was one-way doors, teleporters, sloping passages, uh, rooms that would spin, all of that would to mess you up. Uh, the Lost Caverns of Sajkant, I think uh, that's, a, that's a great that's adventure. That's an amazing module. I did a review on that for the channel. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's my favorite module. And uh, was there seven doors in the middle right. that you had to go to? Yeah, that, right. oh my God. And then you get teleported to a random spot. And I had to start mapping on a totally separate sheet. Okay, gosh darn it. Where? Okay. 
and then I would run. Eventually, might have get to the. <laughs> you would get to. There was one one spot where he'd, <laughs> he would always say this to me, and I, I'll I'll tell you the story. So I was solo adventuring as Melf uh, through that one, and I had with me my sidekick Biff, who is a halfling fighter thief. Uh, and there's a story behind yes. Biff. Biff, yeah, <laughs> Biff, who. Uh, so Biff was a, a man at arms, and I was low level, like not not even fifth level as Melf. And I had come across a room with three whites in it and I had shut the door and run away. And I went back and said, Hmm, how am I going to, how am I going to defeat these whites? I said, I know. So I got like eight man at arms to carry two buckets of oil, right. In each hands or whatever. And we, you know, we walked, we walked to the, to the door. It was a dead end. It was like a dead end hallway and the, it went south and then, east and then the door to the north right and it was like a 30 by 30 or 40 by 40 room in there uh so i said okay we open up the door throw in the oil throw in the torches slam the door and i was gonna let it kind of burn out the the whites right oh, take care well, of yourself <laughs> right fire right? fire solves all problems so i and i wonder now that you know knowing my dad i i wonder and it could have been or it might not have been but there was a uh <laughs> the whites came out and attacked me from behind Apparently, like one or two weights, you know, there was four or five. There, one of one of them came around. There was a secret door that of led out. There was. Right, and uh, and so the uh, you know something happened. This guy got killed, but he wasn't turned into a white. And uh, I, yeah, and, and uh, uh, I of course the treasure. I killed the whites, and he's like, oh, it looks like there's you know some magical ashes there, some scrolls, there's some empty <laughs> bottles of boiled up potions that were there. Yeah, he was rubbing it in, right? But there was there was a magic sword in there, a plus two long sword that I used for many years uh, through, 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 through adventure. That was the main thing I got out of there. But I take these guys out, I pay them their 10 gold or whatever it was, and I pay the wife of this guy the 10 gold, right? You know, and uh, uh, my dad's like, oh, she's wailing, he has children, that sort of stuff. I'm like, I was like, oh. I'm like okay. I said, all right, you know, ma'am, I will, yeah, and I'm a kid, right? I'm like, ma'am, sure, absolutely, ma'am, I, I I'm going to make sure I'm going to, I'll, I'll bring them. I'll find a way to bring them back, bring them back to you. So I go, I find a, a, a temple and I talk to the high priest and he's like, Oh, it's going to be a lot, man. It's like 10,000 gold pieces. A major spell. So I scrape up, you know, I sell off everything that I possibly can. I come up with 10 grand in gold, a lot of money. Cause you have to pay for training, pay for spell. You know, this is a big deal. And, uh, we do it. My dad rolls up his stats, fails his system shock. So he stays dead. Oh no! So I'm like, all right, all right, son of a gun. Okay, so I said I made it. I made an oath. I'm Melf. I made an oath to this lady that I was going to bring, bring her husband back. So I can't, I cannot fail, right? I, I must do this. So I went out of Greyhawk and I found a druid, and of high enough level, and I performed services for him to, uh, and in return he, you know, I went and ventured, did something for him, and then uh, he agreed to reincarnate him. So we rolled on the reincarnation tables, and he came back as a halfling. <laughs> and so my dad rolled up his stats out of the DMG and you know, all the personalities or NPCs or whatever. Sure. So he was, he was like pessimistic, morose. Uh, so he was like, I don't know, boss, if it's going to work. But he was also fanatically loyal. So that was my, ha- my halfling sidekick, Biff. And we went on lots of adventures uh, together ever since then. But I was going through, uh, oh, so I brought him back. I brought Biff back to his wife. His wife was like, he's a halfling. I don't want a halfling. I, I, I knew that was going to happen. I knew it. She's like, I don't want him now. Yeah, I don't want him now. He's like, you know, he was a big drafting guy. Now he's a halfling. Like, no, nah, it's not going to. So, so he was, out, hun. yeah, he was fanatically loyal to me. So he adventured with me and always had my back on stuff. Uh, it, would, it would always give a bit. Uh, I think if you watched uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, remember the robot? Right. That was them. Who was always kind of a bummer. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of how Biff was. <laughs> and my dad just enjoyed, you know, riffing off. Of, you know, oh, I don't think it's going to work, boss. <laughs> so, but, but he was like, so I was going through Saj Camp, pretty much soul adventuring with Biff. Right. That was my my uh, uh, you know henchman. And uh, there is the Gorgamira, right? Remember right. the Gorgamira that was in there? Yeah. So it could breathe fire and you know. So I'm fighting this thing. And uh, I had a treasured, very, very prized magic item uh, that I loved. It was a displacer cloak that I'd found in uh, Castle Greyhawk. It had just, there was a room, you found a secret door, and I was an elf, I happened to find the secret door as I was sure, walking by, I opened it up. 
something fell on top of me. He's like, something falls on you from above. He's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, wait a second. Am I being attacked? Uh, he's like, do you want to stab it? And I was like, well, wait, am I being attacked? He's like, no. I was like, okay, well, I'll just take it off. And it was a cloak. And it turned out to be a magic cloak, a displacer cloak that was just there in the room. I don't know why it was there. This is, you know, you original dungeon. You'd have ripped it and it would ruin the magic. If I, it, correct, 100%. <laughs> and then he could have said, unfortunately, you know, I see the magic essence fade away as you weren't right. So I had this great displacer cloak serve me for years. What a great, wonderful item that is, right? And this Gorgamira breathed out fire breath on me. I failed my save. And. and my cloak failed at save. So uh, <clears throat> so I was down to eight, I got eight or seven hit points. Oh, wow. And I'm against this Gordon here. And I've played Mel for a few years by now. You know, he was maybe seventh level fighter, eighth level magic user, something like that. And, uh, but I wouldn't run away. And so we were going back and forth, this Gordon Mira, and it took about four melee rounds before I, we finally got a hit on him and, and dispatched him. But any one hit from that thing could have killed me. And he was dicing in front of me. It was back and forth. I was like, I was so mad. I was like, nope, I'm not going to, not going to run away. And I killed the Gorgamir. But any, every time I'd get teleported, I'd come back to that room. He'd be like, oh, you see, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> displaced, uh, a trail of, cloak. a trail of, of elven tears and displaced your cloak ashes. And I was like, okay. So, <laughs> like, all right. I know where I'm at. Rubbing it in a little. Yeah, he totally did. Yeah, he totally did. So, but it was a great, it's a great memory, you know. And Absolutely, I, I, sure. I think I went through every single room in Saj Camp. I went on all the wilderness adventures and the Forgotten Temple of Thrizden. I was going to say, all... yeah, Thursden is uh, the, mm -hmm. the side quest in that, isn't it? I've yeah. Got, I've got all those modules. I haven't done Thursden for the channel, but I'm getting ready to. Oh, it's great. That's a, That was so much fun getting the, well, I don't want to give too much away, but some of the, the accoutrement Spoiler that you warning. have to, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But yeah, uh, I still remember, you know, waving the thoroughbull and wearing all the cloak and everything. Yeah. And and if you like that, I would encourage you to look for Founders and Legends on YouTube. Just search Founders and Legends and you should see uh, a series of adventures with uh, Mike Merles running Joe Manganiello as... Uh, uh, come on, Joe Manganiello's uh, uh, Oathbreaker Paladin, uh, Dragonborn, Gosh, Archon. Archon, 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 and yeah. Archon, Archon, yeah. the cruel, Ar Archon the cruel, and Melf. Uh, we adventured together uh, at Founders and Legends One, and Mike Merles was kind enough to run that final adventure. It was amazing, and uh, yeah, and and Thrizden is involved, and we do like three more, uh, three more sessions over the years. Uh, that kind of take us and tie it in more and more. So uh, yeah, Mike's 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 great. That Archon, the cruel character uh, that Joe Mangalo uh, runs, uh, I, I didn't know too much about him, but until he did that guest star on uh, Critical Role, mm -hmm. uh, when they were going up against Vecna, yep. and I have to say that has to be one of the most classic uh, uh, turnabouts and uh, twists, you know, where he's like, cuts off his hand and puts Vecna's hand on there, <laughs> it's only business, I'm out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I think uh, it, for the yeah. for the miniature that they that Wizards of the Coast did for that, they actually have Vecna's hand on him. Uh, mm -hmm. for the, for, I think that's right for that miniature. So that was pretty cool. That's a that's a pretty cool miniature that they got that set on there for him and his crew uh, is on there. Yeah, Joe, Joe is a a nerd's nerd. You know, yeah, he's, he's got like the uh, Gygax Memorial Dungeon. He does. Yeah, I've game I've gamed in the Gygax Memorial Dungeon with him. It was uh, just a ton of fun, and. You know, he's serious about his his gaming. He is he will talk to you in depth about nerd stuff. Uh, and that's he's really like sure he's six five, he's yoked, he's uh, you know, a movie star. He's a nerd. <clears throat> he's a nerd. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it that's is cool. cool. Yeah, real nice guy. Now you know, I've been running fifth edition myself for about seven years. Um, and then I switched I switched recently over to Hyperborea. And mm -hmm. no knock on fifth edition. I mean, it's an enjoyable game, and we we I ran three campaigns with it, and we had a great time. But I think there's a I think there's a certain sector of, of players since so many people have came into the game over the last few years, uh, where they might be looking for a different kind of challenge, and I think that an influx of old school uh, games 
or in old school gamers looking for that style or looking at the history of D and D uh, might be might be finding a new foothold. I mean, have you seen anything like that, or do you, do you, do you get that feeling maybe? You know, you, you're, you're kind uh, of an, like I said, I'm not knocking fifth edition. I'm just saying it's it's a, old school is a different challenge. With so many players coming into the uh, into the game, some people might be looking to change up. Yeah, I, I think so. And and we're going to see, you know, Wizards has whatever, 5.5 or 6th edition or whatever they're going to call it. Right. But they said it's going to be compatible with 5th edition. So I'm not expecting a, too much of a divergence uh, from that. Uh, I think uh, it's a game that's been around for a while. That's It's a good game. Uh, Castles and Crusades. I think yes. that's that's solid. And that's a great option for people. It has the Siege Engine system in it, which I you know, was around before uh, <laughs> before uh, Fifth Edition, right? Right. And mm-hmm. kind of had your kind of your difficulty check type of stuff, your challenge ratings well, you uh, know, going the on there. The saving from Castles and Crusades are almost identical to Fifth Edition. Yeah, in so, a lot of ways. Yep. Uh, and I, so, yeah, Steve did a great job with that. Steve Chanel at Troll Lord. Mm-hmm. I, I interviewed Steve Chanel for the channel uh, last month. And I've done like a bunch of different videos on Castles and Crusades for the channel because I love I love that system too because it's kind of like a blend of fifth edition, which is modern mechanics with ascending ACs and all that, plus the really cool siege engine, uh, which allows the DM to cater the challenge to whatever the thing is and to the group, and it goes up by level, but it's not like overly complicated. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Dungeon Call Classics, uh, yes. I. That that's great. I just only played that like one time, and and but I, but uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I've heard lots of good stuff about it. Uh, looking at you know the guys at Goodman Games, amazing it's folks. It's a Gonzo yeah. game. It really is. Yeah, and then of course uh, you're wearing a Hyperborea shirt from uh, you know Northwind Adventures, Jeff Delanian. Also excellent stuff. So uh, you know those are our systems that I would encourage folks who you know hey I've played Fifth Edition. Is there something else in the fantasy area? Uh, that I want. Sure. Uh, otherwise, if there's something in fifth edition that you don't particularly like, you know, <laughs> as the DM, you can house rule stuff. So I was just going to say, just house rule it, man. It's okay. As long as your table, as long as you're consistent and generally the folks at the table understand why you're doing something and, and that's what they're, they've signed up for. They'll probably have a great time. Uh, my world of Oak Room setting in the Blighted Lands is meant to be a little bit more challenging, right? So I thought of, well, you know, fifth edition, well, that's okay. I'll let people, I'll write it for fifth edition and people can can tweak it. I can make some, you know, notes in the, hey, this is what I would suggest is some house rules. But if it's a fifth edition game, you know, run it for your table. Uh, and like I said, there's no wrong way, in my opinion, there's no wrong way to play D&D. If everyone at your table is involved, immersed, having a good time, you're, you're doing it right. It's a game. It's meant to bring people together, uh, have a good time, form bonds of, of, of friendship Absolutely. that hopefully last decades, right? I mean, I have guys from that I played D&D with in the army. They they come to GaryCon. You know, oh, I was like yeah, ni- sure. you know, eight, 19 years old. We went to Desert Storm and stuff, but I stay in touch with those gamer, the guys that I was ga- gaming with, much more so than the folks who were my good friends, but I didn't game with. We found a way to stay together as, as, as gamers, and now I see a bunch of them once a year. Yep, I I can share a similar story with that. I have two friends that I knew back from high school. We were in chess club together. I mean, like it's kind of like how I got into that whole gaming group anyway, because I got into the chess club, and then that led to a bunch of guys who were playing D and D. And then, of course, a lot of those guys I'm still in contact with because we have that shared experience. Yeah, sure, absolutely. D and D is a great way to build long term relationships with the friends because you have these shared memories. They didn't really happen. They, yeah, you know. They, yeah, that's it. It's just it's what's the value of role playing? Uh, you know, a vignette in a training course for work, right? right well, sure. you're right. So there's there's training value in that, right? So just because it's a heroic persona in a game, you still are invested in it, and you're still putting in that teamwork, the uh, you know small group dynamics, all sort of stuff. That's and all guess team what? Building. Yeah, and guess what though? When you've got just when Melf was duking it out with that Gorgamira, I was invested. If he had died, that would have been a terrible blow, right? So this was sure. this is seared into my brain as a what I was a nine or ten, eleven, maybe something. I was a kid, right? But I still remember that. And my memory is terrible. <laughs> but I still remember that because it was so exciting. So that sort of shared risk, you know, just like a band of brothers in war, right? 
uh, you've shared that hardship, even though it's a pretend hardship, it still forms the bond and makes you a team that sticks together over years and years. Yeah, well, you have that those table moments where somebody, your guys are all like, oh man, we're all about to die and you know, this is the end and I don't see any way out of it. And then somebody has that great idea that saves you at the last minute. I mean, like, and the table goes wild. That very, I don't, I can't think of anything that really compares to that, you know, and I've been through a lot of different experiences. You know, I run, I'm a DJ business. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, and you know, I, I ha- have had some really wonderful uh, group experiences, but you know, that intimacy with your friends sharing these stories and hardships and adventures is uh, pretty, pretty much, you know, what's sucked me into it for 40 years. So, yeah. Yeah. And exactly it 40 years, man. I mean, it's D and D is coming up on its 50th year in 2024. Holy smokes. Wow. And wow. And more, it, more people are playing it. How many games come and go in a year or two, right? Just in a year or two, like, and, Oh, this is popular. And then it's gone. Right. I mean, D and before, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, role-playing games didn't exist. There was, you know, role assumption games or whatever, but role-playing games didn't exist. And certainly the ability to export this information for other folks to replicate, you know, didn't, it, it wasn't there. So the, I'm sure we're all old because I'm preaching to the choir, but the idea of a cooperative game as opposed to an adversarial game, something that didn't have a board, right? right sure. the, what are the, what are the limits? It's the limits of your imagination, right? Sure. You have a map, but people can just go off the map and do whatever they want. Right. I mean, that's, that's, and then we just go with it. That's so there is no, it's, it's boundless. It's only limited by your imagination. Um, and it's serial. It's, it's, it's not, you know, when you play monopoly and you finish a game, you put it away and you bring it out again, you restart it. It's not like you continue that monopoly game, right? Whereas D and D, you continue your adventures. Your play, your character changes, advances. Sometimes they might get diminished, especially if they ran into those weights and they got touched, <laughs> and they would be diminished, right? But yeah, so there's there's consequences that carry over session to session. Your experience points and all that. Revolutionary, completely revolutionary uh, in in gaming. And all the people who who are playing games today, or younger people, have no idea because that is taken for granted it's a big look at, right now yeah well i mean okay i'm gonna play world of warcraft or yeah guess what that's all that's all D D. You, know you know what i think luke is um a lot of people wrote off dungeons and dragons when video games became so immersive and you could get together uh, with your friends online and what have you um uh, but you know there's an ai and an ai is not a human being and i don't think there and, and that doesn't compare to being physically in the room with your friends uh, and you've got a human person who is running the game, who can interpret and react and expand upon and do oh, all oh, the What's that, Dave? What's that? I was totally ignoring you. I was stuck in my screen. You're a thousand percent right, man. It, there's nothing that can compare to that. It's what do we do all day at work? Look Most at screens. Look at screens. What do you see young people or even old, even guys like me, even, you know, 50, sure. 50 year old guys, Guilty even out charged. to out to dinner, right? Yep. Looking at your phone, are you spending time with your family or your buddy that you're with there with? Maybe not as much as you should be. Well, when it comes to game time, hopefully we put these down. Right. And we're here and we're we're getting that much needed human face to face interaction, right? Right. That's absolutely. so so valuable. So valuable. And you know, I, I can personally say that like when I had uh, uh, management training that my Dungeons and Dragons experience was beneficial. Uh, to that the team building and it Mm -hmm. it works both ways because to me dungeon master is a leadership position yeah i i ever since i hit basic training i was made a squad leader i made and sergeant in under three i was the leadership awardee at my primary leadership development course when i went to ocs i was always in the top in leadership i've always been put as a second lieutenant, I was in captain slots and then as captain and major. So I never, I was always put in charge of stuff. And why is it? Is it because I'm just so naturally talented? No, it's probably no. because, no, I don't think so. I think it's because had, I've been since experience. I was a kid. Yeah. I had experience. I had, I, yeah, I had, I had gotten experience points in these areas ahead of time through gaming that I was able to apply. So, yeah, it's not that I was necessarily born and imbued with, you know, from the, the, the higher powers with the special abilities. I, I just don't know. You got to, to be Gary Gygax's son. I, there might be, you might, got, you might have lucked out a little bit. 
there you go. So yes, and, and what a wonderful <laughs> legacy and a, and, a, and, a, and a great thing. And I need to, you know, I really am going to write a book or something about this because growing up Gygax and just my experiences as patient zero to role playing, I don't remember <laughs> not. Yeah, I don't remember not not role playing. I mean, I've been role playing ever since I can remember and i see the world through that schema right you know i look at someone and be like oh that guy is you know that's a low wisdom move right there and, you know just, you know uh negative you know this guy's charisma he's got a negative loyalty adjustment right and i really visualize the world oftentimes in these in, in this way and it's great because so many people understand it now but you know not, not always back uh, in the, day, back in the early days yeah. not people did yeah like what's wrong with you luke yeah they're like okay this guy's a little odd uh but uh, I, I think that there is, uh, you know, leadership and, uh, you know, leadership principles, leadership skills that are, you know, learned through gaming as well as many other beneficial uh, things. And I just think it'd be wonderful to interview people like Elon Musk and, uh, uh, you know, and ask them how Dungeons and Dragons shaped who they are or, you know, or Joe Manganiello. Right, sure. And Diesel or, or whomever, right? Uh, and just ask them, hey, what, you know, what did D&D &D mean to you? What was its impact on you? What did you learn from it? What were you able to take from D&D &D and put into the world that brought you to where you are today? Was, you know, and have them pick some things out. Do they credit it? Do they not credit it? But I think that'd be an interesting podcast and then a book. That, 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 sounds, like, <clears throat> that sounds like a great idea. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, there's so many people that are famous that you're like, I didn't know that he played D&D. &D. And you're like, oh, he's one of us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I need to do or that. I'm retired. Is, you know, he or she's one yeah. of us. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, I think is a former or, or gamer. He, oh, wow. uh, maybe, maybe he still games. Yeah, one of Clint Eastwood's, uh, Clint Eastwood's son, I think is a gamer. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> BTO, Bachman Turner Overdrive. I think they wanted, uh, the guys there wanted my dad's autograph on some stuff. But, yeah, back in the, yeah, it was back in the 80s. But yeah, sure. uh, so, there, you know, I wouldn't, I would be shocked if, if like Getty Lee and Alex Lifeson and, and Neil Peart never played D and D. You know the guys from Rush, they had to. I mean, they're to. such huge. They they're such huge nerds. They they totally had to. Uh, but yeah, no, I I've got so many ideas uh, bouncing around of, of cool stuff to do. I just need to uh, you know get get a pick pick a couple of them and, and go with it. Not be too uh, yeah. There's so much fun stuff I want to do and only so much time. Right. Uh, like that's that's I think that's everybody's problem in their uh, middle age problems, right? There's so much stuff you want to do, and only so much time to to really be able to get things done, and to and maybe to be realistic about what you can reasonably accomplish. Right, right. I'm yeah. I'm going through that right now. So like uh, during the uh, COVID thing, I was putting out two videos a week for the channel. <laughs> Hi guys, sorry. I'm sorry. I haven't been producing. <laughs> so, that, that's but, a lot. People don't realize how much work goes into setting stuff up coordinating it, thinking of the questions, doing your research. It's at least three to one, I would imagine, right? For your time, maybe more. I mean, it's a matter of, first of all, you have to, I mean, like I do everything script based. So every video uh, generates four or five pages at least of, of written, written material. And then there's the research that goes into it because like I do a lot of historical context. Okay. Uh, one of the things, you know, cause I'm doing all, that's where all my knowledge comes from. I have a PhD in D and D, right? So, uh, <laughs> I've PhD to, and D. So I've got to, you know, I like to research the history and, and bring out the historical context and uh, try to talk about where these ideas came from. And that takes time to look it in. And then you've got to put that into a format that you can pr uh, provide to somebody and you can say, you know, make it understandable so they can, you can teach it to them or explain it in a way that they understand it. And it's also entertaining. Right. Uh, and yeah. then uh, and it's not boring. And then, uh, you know, I like to talk about the artwork and talk about the artists and, you know, <laughs> my favorite pieces and do all that yeah. kind of stuff. So it's it, and then once you get all that written, then you've got to do the visual aspect of it and put that in an order. And then you got to time the then you got to do the recording, the voiceover and then coordinate the uh, voiceover with the with the uh, visuals. So, um, I mean, it's a lot of work and, and you actually and you actually have a job that pays, you, right? <laughs> yes, I have a job that pays. I'm very, very lucky that, that I have a job that I love. I, you know, but yeah. I do trivia uh, oh. and I'm a DJ and I do karaoke. So it's like uh, pretty uh, cool. Yeah, that's my full time job. I've been doing that for 14 oh. years. Yeah, oh, I didn't realize that. I don't, I don't know if you ever heard of this. This guy, uh, the dude named John Peterson. I don't know if you ever heard of John Peterson. Uh, no, you, I. But, but you really I, have I've it? seen that book, but I've seen that oh, yeah. book. This is great. This came out in October, Game Wizards by right. John John Peterson. He's uh, 
basically a D&D historian, super nice guy, by the way. Uh, but he writes scholar in a scholarly way and researches meticulously from original source documents uh, about D&D. So he's done a couple books. He did Playing at the World. Uh, that one is like reading a college text. I've told him very dry. I haven't been able to make it through that. That one's like sit down with like a two gallon jug of water. You're going to need it. You got to <laughs> soldier on through this one. It's tough, but filled with well researched information. Like if he's telling it to you, he's like, I was in this guy's garage. I pulled out the the newsletter and read it. You know, you know, I bought the newsletter and this is what it says. And here's a picture of it. And this is where this came from. You know, he's very meticulous in and you know well researched and then of course uh I'll, i'd pull it out but i'm sure uh, most people are probably familiar with art and arcana which is the visual history of dungeons yeah, and that's dragons beautiful that's beautiful so so john peterson and mike whitwer uh were involved in that uh, mike whitwer wrote uh, empire of imagination which is a biography of my father um uh, which is it was very uh, very nice and it, in, in <laughs> Game Wizards is much easier to read, by the way, by John Pearson. Game Wizards is a great book. You should pick it up. That's about uh, basically the uh, my uh, Dave Arneson and my dad and kind of their interactions. They had uh, some some rough interactions, uh, and it kind of tells the story there. And and, and, and you should read it. There's it, it's 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 a good book. If you're interested in Dungeons and Dragons, you want to know about its history, its origins, its beginnings, Game Wizards is a great book. Empire of Imagination is a great read. That's a very light read. It's also on Audibles. Uh, and again, it's by Witwer, W-I-T-W-E-R. Uh, Empire of Imagination, very, very well done. And I got to actually meet and become friends with Mike through his work there. Uh, he did that as his master's thesis oh, and wow. then published wow. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and he worked on then Art and Arcana along with his brother, Sam, and... Um, Kyle Newman, who's a director, um, and he did, oh, he did a, a movie about some nerdy guys who break into the Star Wars ranch. Uh, uh oh, it's, I can't, I forget what it's called, but he's, it's quite, it's, it's a good, it's a good one. He's, and he does, he directs all sorts of stuff. He's, he's a cool dude, a gamer. I met him through Joe Manganello, so, uh, he's part of the LA D D group. Uh, but they did Art and Arcana along with John Peterson and, and uh, amazing work. If you, have, if you don't have that, I have like four copies of it. It's so good. That sounds pretty cool. It is. It's great. I mean, there's there's so much neat stuff uh, out there about Dungeons and Dragons and the history of D&D &D, uh, and so many nerds and new nerds uh, to meet and talk to. I think it's wonderful. And it's one of the reasons why I did, besides Gary Count, I do Founders and Legends every year. And that's a stream. I started off doing studio, studio streams and then I just went all virtual with, with COVID. Who knows, maybe we'll get back in a studio this summer, but I do it around my dad's uh, birthday, which is July 27th. But my intent was, hey, I wanna show fifth edition players, you know, through reaching out through media and, and show them, hey, this is kind of, an, here's some old, you know, I run an AD&D &D game and a 5D game. So hopefully people get do to both. do, yeah, no get to see both. And then at, at, at GaryCon, you know, people had suggested to me, well, you should only run games that your dad was tied to. Like only those should be the only games that are allowed at Gary Con. Like, mm, nope. nope. <laughs> you, well, what I'm not going to come if I'm not going to. Gary Con is just. I said, okay, have a nice day. We're going to play. We're going to play all sorts of games. There's no reason we would limit. Uh, you know, limit the fun. I love having Adventures League. There, are Pathfinder. You know, the guys guys doing Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, people doing uh, you know running chain mail, uh, people running OD and D. I, it's it's fine. You know, run run. Uh, uh, my daughters uh, played My Little Pony when they were little, and it's so they played My Little Pony. Adventure. Carlos Lysing ran My Little Pony for my daughters at GaryCon, and they loved That's it. That's awesome. Yeah. So so yeah, it's so it's it's fantastic. So all you know, all games are welcome. Obviously, you know, we don't want games that are, you know, disrespectful to people, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want to be. But sure. if you can run a, a, if you can run a game in public, you know, a decent, a decent game, bring whatever system you want. Heck, you can even play fourth edition if you want to. Fourth edition isn't a bad game. <laughs> it's, it's just a joke. But yeah, it's, it's not, not a bad game. It just didn't feel game. like D&D. &D. It didn't feel like D&D. &D it to did me. not feel like D&D, &D, though. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was a, it was the game was fine. It's it, it's it's a fine game. Just. I did not feel like I was playing D and D, and that was my problem. Right, uh, right there with you. I mean, I I legit tried to play it. I played it for six months, and I 
okay, it's time to move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I got you. Uh, yeah, we don't want to start edition wars, but I'm just saying. Sorry, like said, guys. Is... Fourth edition players, we still love you guys. All right. No, yeah. No, no down votes. You know, don't don't get no. busy in the comments. We're cool with you. All right. We love you. There's there's no wrong way to play D and D. As uh, long it, as you're having fun, if you if you're having fun, guys, we love it too. Yeah. <laughs> hey, That's one how more I... question, Luke. Before we go, sure. uh, give me some of your appendix N favorites. Ooh, okay. So uh, I would say uh, Jack Vance, the Dying Earth, I think is in there. Yeah, that's I've, a given, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I love that. Then um, also the Planet of Adventure series. I really enjoyed the Planet of Adventure, which is, I think, you know, it has like the Noom, the Deer Deer, uh, all those just little Jack Vance uh, books. Those are a lot of fun. High Arrow's Journey. Um, let's see, who did High Arrow's Journey? Maybe I have that one right back here. Here we go. Hiro's Journey, Sterling Elan Year. This is that this is, is one that, that is a bookshelf of you just you, you just reach back there and get whatever you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, That's yeah. A magic I, right, item. Right next to it, I guess I should pull out Empire of Imagination. That was I talked about that, which is Mike Whitworth book. Uh, yeah. So, oh, another copy of Game Wizards. Oh yeah, Jack Vance. Planet of Adventure series. That's All right. okay. good stuff right there. So I like that. Uh, John Belair's Facing the Frost. That was a lot of fun. Super, super small book. Is that up here? Uh, I think I gave up. Oh, I lied. It is right up it's, here. It's a magic item. We got it at your fingertips. Yeah. So, uh, John Belair's Facing the Frost. He's a children's author. And this was his only like non-children's book, I think, that he wrote. But my dad read it to me, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that so much. I have to check that out. That looks like I've fun. kept it. Yeah, and it's just a light, light little one about two wizards who have to go and investigate something. Very, very lighthearted, not serious, serious uh, fantasy at all. Uh, let's see. What am I? What else? Uh, what other authors have I enjoyed? Those are those are some of the main ones that I really dig. Oh, uh, obviously Conan. I, I, I enjoyed reading the Conan books. Uh, Piers Anthony was a lot of fun. I don't know if Love that's an appendix Piers N Anthony. or not, but Piers Anthony was so much fun. Blue Adept uh, series. And, yes, there you go. That's the one with styles, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Right, I totally where, love where, that. where he's got like a uh, he's it's a science fiction and a fantasy. Yes. Uh, at the same time. Yep, those were great. And Piers Anthony was a nice dude. I got to meet him uh, at some book show or whatever. He's nice, and he had a cute daughter when it, who was my age, so. Uh, oh, wow. well, there but you go. didn't work out didn't work out <laughs> oh, I what is, what are you gonna do? your wife's happy about that <laughs> yes yeah, so she's not near shot so that's a good thing uh say but, anything. okay all right yes. lips are sealed here uh uh new books that i'm reading i've just kind of enjoyed uh it's kind of it's it's a fun little series it's uh the spellmonger series spellmonger by terry mancore is kind of actually what i'm listening to now i do drive back and forth, you know, commute to work. So uh, I'll listen to uh, podcasts and for Audible. <laughs> yeah, Audible is great, man. If you, yeah, I think it's well worth the. Well, it's under twenty bucks, and it's, it's well worth it uh, to have that stuff at your fingertips and and be able to discover books, whether it's you know fun recreational stuff or leadership books or whatever history. Okay. So, so hopefully we'll pick up Audible as a sponsor for you here at that little shout out to him. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I should, maybe I should contact Audible. And maybe get a little get, get a little. Sponsor there you go. There. Get a little kickback. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's that's yeah. I mean, there's there's tons and tons of great stuff. But Appendix N is filled with uh, uh, tons of inspirational stuff. Oh, there was Three Hearts and Three Lions is another good book, I believe. Uh, who wrote Three Hearts and Three Lions? Paul Anderson, maybe. Okay. I don't know. I'm grabbing that out of that one. I don't have behind me. Uh, but that's the one where the troll came from, I think. Oh, gosh. And now that we're talking about uh, that sort of stuff, I thought of uh, El Sprague the Camp and the Incomplete Enchanter. Right. Those those are so fun. I love that Harold Shea, uh, the Harold Shea books. So, yeah, uh, boy, there's just tons of them. And uh, I think those are all on Appendix N. But I haven't looked at Appendix N in a, in a minute. I'll let you know on a secret. I didn't – I haven't read all the D&D &D books behind me. When I had a question, I would just – Say hey, Dad. What what's this? <laughs> so, so I I didn't really have to research. How do you do this? And he'd tell me. And guess what? Sometimes it's not the way it's written in the book. I've said, well, that's no, the way we played it. And they're like, stop. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he'd be like, well, that's not the way the spell works. I'm like, oops, sorry. <laughs> that's how we played it. So that's how I remembered it. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm more of I'm more of a verbal learner than uh, from reading. So if I hear it, 
if someone briefs me on it, I'm good. But if I have to read it, I pick up less, less of the content. Right. Luke, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, come up here on the channel. It's been a real pleasure having you on. Oh, so much fun. Thank you. And uh, I hope uh, everyone enjoys it. And if you, if you uh, want to come to GaryCon, uh, I'm sure he'll put a link down there, uh, GaryCon.com. Or if you want to just sign up for a badge, play.garycon.com. It's March 24th to 27th uh, in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin at the Grand Geneva Resort. Uh, that interestingly, interestingly enough, was the former location for Gen Con, uh, Gen Con Ten, I believe it was. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, so that that place used to be called the Playboy Club, uh, but it changed ownership a few times, and it is Grand Geneva. So it's a very interesting layout. It's a Frank Lloyd Wright design, and it's been there since I think the late '60s. Uh, but it's a really neat place. It's a you know a very beautiful resort, golf, all sorts of fun stuff there as well. But from for those for those few days, it's turned into uh, a nerd, uh, nerd central. It's overrun with thousands of gamers. We take over the whole hotel, and it's nothing but Gary Con. Awesome. Hopefully, I get to see you there. Yeah, definitely. I'll see you there. All right, Luke. Thanks. Thank you all so much for watching, and happy holidays. I hope you all have a great time with friends and family. Coming up later this week, I'll be taking an in-depth look at Gazetteer 13, the Shadow Elves. And after that, I'll be examining using music at your gaming table and share my favorite music with you. I'd also like to thank all my patrons who continue to support the channel month after month. Without you, these videos would not be possible. Please give this video a like, comment, and share. And please check out my Teespring store for great gaming swag, t-shirts, carry bags, coffee cups, and more. Join the channel's Facebook page, RPG Retro Reviews, Consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through the PayPal tip jar. A link is in the description. As always, my friends, may your D20 roll true and game on. <laughs>